Hello and welcome and today's video is about something which has probably been one of the proudest achievements of my life so far. It took a lot of time and energy and effort to complete. It's something that means that I can go skiing and climbing in the mountains with paying clients and friends. Also something that means that now I'm envisaging buying a house and starting a family. So let's talk about this. So what is the IFMGA? IFMGA stands for the International Federation of Mountain Guides Associations. How come on this badge, there's other acronyms that are on there? UIAGM, IVBV, for example. Well, that's just different languages. French is UIAGM, German is IVBV. From now on, we're just gonna to refer to this as the IFMGA. So each country has its own Mountain Guides Association. Not every country, but most Alpine countries and some other countries throughout the world. We also have Mountain Guides Associations in Norway, in the UK, which is the one that I did it through, in North America, uh, various other countries throughout the world. They have their own guides associations. Now, those associations are responsible for training and assessing, and also making sure that the standards are being met. So for example, if a British guide is out skiing and they have an accident, we have to submit a report form to the uh, British Association of Mountain Guides and we have to tell them what happened and they investigate that and they decide whether we can carry on guiding or whether more investigation needs to happen and more disciplinary action uh, could be involved. So that's the difference between the IFMGA and the BMG, for example. The IFMGA is the overarching body of everything and the BMG, the British Association of Mountain Guides, is the UK school for mountain guides and they're responsible for the training and assessment, among other things. So what is the remit of an IFMGA guide? Now, that's where things become a little bit hazy. Now, some mountain regions you don't need any qualifications to work in. For example, the UK, you don't need a qualification. In Norway, you don't need a qualification. In the United States, you don't need to be an IFMGA guide to guide somebody up uh, Mount Rainier, for example. But in the Alps, if you want to take somebody up high, onto the glaciers, into the mountains, you need this qualification. Without it, you can't get insurance. If you can't get insurance, you're operating illegally in the eyes of the law of the main Alpine countries, which are France, Switzerland, Italy, and Austria. So for guiding in the Alps, you need this qualification. So if you find somebody who's offering guiding, ask to see their credentials, ask to see their card, make sure that they've got an IFMGA sticker on the back and it's current and up to date. And that means that they will have insurance. Excellent. Now, there are a few exceptions to that. They might be an aspirant guide, so they may be on their way to becoming a full IFMGA guide, and they may not have their sticker, they may not have the badge, but they'll be working within a set of rules for the country that they're working in. There are a few other qualifications in France, for example, where you can do certain types of activities with a different qualification. But we're not gonna go into that right now. We're just gonna talk about the IFMGA. Oh, hi, Harry, how are you doing? <laughs> you come to tell everybody what an IFMGA guide is? Brilliant. <laughs> How do you become an IFMGA guide? As I said before, each country is responsible for its own training and assessing of becoming a mountain guide. And I can't really talk about these different, the differences of those here because I only really have experience of doing it through the British system. So the first thing you need to do if you want to become a guide is to gain some experience in the mountains. Now, for this, I would budget a minimum of five years, probably more likely 10 or 15 years. It takes a lot to do everything that's on the list that's required. And it means that you have to travel around all over the place, getting different types of experience, climbing mountains, rock climbing, ice climbing, all that kind of stuff before you can apply. Now that experience would include things like 
uh, multi-pitch rock climbing in the UK, so you have to do something like 50 multi-pitch rock climbs in quite serious scenarios. So in the mountains in Scotland or North Wales or the Lake District or on the sea cliffs around the UK. Big committing routes that of a certain grade, E15B uh, is the grade that you're looking at. So getting that experience takes quite a while. The next part of the experience would be 50 winter climbs in the UK predominantly in Scotland, of a grade of grade five, but I would probably suggest you need to do some grade sixes and maybe even some grade sevens before you go in there as well. Now that can take some time. As we know in the UK, the weather and conditions are very fickle and getting that experience could take years unless you're living up in Scotland. The next part of the experience would be alpine climbing. So you need to have climbed 25 alpine summits of which 10 of those need to be grade très difficile or TD. And of those 10, five of those need to be on big alpine kind of north faces, mixed climbing, big long thousand meter routes. Things like the north face of the Eiger, the north face of the Matterhorn, north face of the Grand Jura, stuff like that. So that is often the aspect of the guides course which is the most difficult because those kind of conditions maybe come along once every few years to climb those faces and yeah you have to have gained quite a lot of experience doing other things before you can quest out and do those. For me actually I ended up doing more than enough of those and they told me that I needed to go back and do a few more rock climbs in the UK so I went back and did that before I started the course. Now this qualification also covers skiing and predominantly ski touring. So part of the experience is doing long hut to hut ski tours in the mountains. So things like the Haute route, uh, the Western Oberlin tour, uh, tours around Grand Paradiso, for example, where you're staying in huts, doing a journey through the mountains. Now, the level of skiing experience was traditionally a little bit low in the BMG, but the, the level is definitely being pushed up quite a lot. So I would suggest to folk if they want to do uh, this course and they're thinking about doing it is make sure you've got a really good level of off-piece skiing before you start. It will just set you up really well for the courses uh, later on. Gaining all that experience Although it doesn't sound like much on paper, it's definitely going to take some time. So budgeting something like 5, 10, maybe even 15 years to get all that experience together before you can even apply to the course will be really useful. So once you've gained the experience, you've written down uh, a logbook of everything that you've done, you've included the names of your partners, you've had somebody go through that logbook and check it off and they say that you're ready to start the course, then you do a series of inductions. Now these inductions are basically to back up what you've said on your logbook and to make sure that uh, you are operating at the standard that is required to be a guide. So you have to be able to climb E15B, you have to be able to climb Scottish Grade 5 and you have to have a good level of off-piste ski ability. Once you've done those inductions, and generally you get a little training course at the end of each induction as well, just to help you along your journey. Once you've done those, you can then start the course. And in the UK, we start with rock climbing. The rock climbing element is in North Wales, and what you typically do is a training course at the start, maybe two, and then you have a period of consolidation before you then do a final assessment. Now, these assessments are really difficult. They're six days long. You're often out uh, into the night doing navigation exercises, doing big climbs in maybe boots, um, climbing in all kinds of different conditions in the rain, uh, you know, on sea cliffs, doing rescue scenarios, all that kind of stuff. So those assessments are quite difficult. And normally you either pass, which is great, you get a deferral, which means you have to either come back a few months later and do one day, or if it's more than one day, it might be two days, and then you have to do it the following year. And the other thing that could happen is you fail the whole uh, exam, and then you have to come back and do the whole thing. So yeah, it's pretty stressful. You don't really want to 
skip a whole year and, and uh, you know lose out on that time. So the first module is UK summer rock climbing and then we move up to Scotland and do everything up there. So again we have a training course at the start and then an assessment at the end of the winter and you have this period in the middle where you go out with your friends and your peers and you go and climb. You can't climb as if you're guiding so you know, you figure out how to keep the ropes managed correctly so they're not crossing themselves. You figure out how to build belays quickly and efficiently almost anywhere. You figure out how to navigate in the darkness. You figure out how to look after people and manage people's uh, safety and happiness throughout the day as well. So that consolidation period is really important and a lot of people they sometimes they skip this consolidation period because they have other jobs that they have to do and they miss out on this really important learning period in between so you really need to be budgeting your finances so you can do the course take all this time off work and do the assessment at the end without having any issues and also you know there's nobody giving away uh, free bits of gear here and there you need to make sure you have all the equipment necessary to do everything and it's expensive as we know you know ice axes crampons harness they all kind of wear out after a while and you need to make sure that when you turn up to the assessment that you're in good new functioning kit that isn't going to break on you halfway through a six day week so once we finish the summer UK aspect and the winter in Scotland. You then do another two training courses, one about summer alpine climbing and one about ski touring and off-piece skiing in the winter. Once you've done those training courses, you then become what's known as an aspirant guide. Now an aspirant guide is somebody who's able to take people out uh, guiding in the mountains, in the Alps, uh, but they have to do it under the supervision of a full IFMGA guide who's been guiding for three years. As an aspirant guide, you have to get a, a load of experience again, and this normally takes two summers and one full winter uh, to get that experience. Once you've got all that experience working with different people, you submit another logbook to the association, and then you can do the final uh, two exams, which is alpine climbing and skiing. Again, stressful exams, uh, especially the alpine, the summer alpine test, uh, that one is pretty full on. You end up climbing some big routes and you know guiding people around on glaciers. And one of the most difficult things that I did actually was uh, a crevasse rescue uh, with somebody who weighed just a little bit more than I did. Uh, it was quite icy and yeah, it was it was a, a difficult thing to do for sure. So once you've finished those two assessments, maybe you've had a defer, you've had to wait a year, or you could do that one extra day, um, you finish and you become an IFMGA guide. And they hand you one of these. Great, you're a guide. You can guide in the mountains, but that's not where the story finishes. Having this qualification doesn't mean that you can just head out into the Alps and do whatever you want. You do need to be registered in the country that you want to work in. So for example, I work in Italy, Switzerland, and France all the time. I have to make sure that I have a work permit for those three countries otherwise I would be operating illegally. Now that is actually quite a difficult thing and it has become more difficult since Brexit. But with this qualification you can get insurance and you can essentially do kind of whatever you want. You can take people into the, into the mountains, you can take them up onto the glaciers, go skiing, go climbing, do whatever you want. After a couple of years you need to do CPD. CPD is continued professional development and that is basically making sure that people are getting some more uh, training uh, throughout their career to keep the standards high and make sure things aren't slipping. So that is a really important thing and that's managed by the BMG. I'm actually gonna go and do some CPD next week. So I'm gonna stop rambling on now. Thanks very much for watching. If you think I made a mistake or if you've got any advice for anybody or you've got any questions, then go down there, leave me a comment. Um, and make sure you give this video a thumbs up if you found it uh, informative or interesting. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. That's gonna help me grow and do more videos. And as always, I'll see you in the next one. Cheers, guys.